Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about finance, econometrics, data analytics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. My name is Seba, and today we're investigating a very exciting, yet often overlooked uh, topic uh, in uh, empirical finance and stock market anomalies, which is the other January effect. We all know about the conventional January effect, the popular one, uh, the big brother of January effects, uh, which essentially uh, is about uh, stock market returns being higher on average in Januarys, uh, which has been a very big uh, deal in finance literature and uh, arguably in uh, investment practice around 80s and 90s. Uh, this January effect has since largely disappeared from developed markets, uh, at least, uh, but it has a younger brother, uh, the other January effect, which is uh, a regularity that was discovered by Cooper et al. in the 2006 General Financial Economics paper, which is very, very much under-discussed. Uh, especially in uh, uh, terms of its implications for financial practice. And while the conventional January effect might have disappeared, uh, the other January effect seems to still be quite relevant. What is the idea behind the uh, other January effect? The idea is that uh, the return that we observe at the start of a particular year uh, in January so we record uh, what is the total stock market return in January, has substantial predictive power over how the stock market is going to perform throughout the remainder of the year. So it's not about uh, a difference in the return of January versus something else, but it's about the predictive power, the stock market predictability that January return uh, has. So essentially for trading, if that is the case, we could monitor uh, what is the return in January for a particular year, and then based on that, uh, adjust our investment strategy uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, if the return is positive, we could uh, uh, be uh, more aggressive. Uh, we could take on leverage, invest in riskier assets. And if it's negative, we could be more conservative, delever, uh, invest in safer assets or just sit in cash or in government bonds. Or if we're thinking about international implications, uh, we could invest in various markets based on where January is a good performing month. Uh, just because it's a pretty low frequency um, phenomenon, as we only have as many observations as we have years, here looking very, very far back into the past might be a very useful idea. And here I'm uh, using um, quite uh, a long historical sample of monthly uh, US stock market returns. Uh, the data source um, is uh, the Yale International Center of Finance for the uh, 1816 through 1925. And from 1927 onwards, I'm using the good old Kenneth French uh, website database. Uh, however, there are some missing years here. So we have to exclude 1926 because it's only available from uh, July onwards on the Kenneth French website. Uh, and so we cannot really assess the predictability uh, of returns based on January because we haven't got a January for 1926. And um, uh, in terms of the Yale data, uh, 1822 and 1867 had to be excluded because for these years, uh, only annual uh, return is available and therefore monthly returns can only be extrapolated as uh, like one twelfth of the annual. So it's not really helpful when we're assessing the predictability of annual returns based on January. So that's why we have got uh, 206 uh, total years. So uh, 1816 uh, is the first year and 2024 is the last year we've got. We can use 2025 
because 2025 hasn't ended yet. And anything can happen uh, up until the end of 2025. Uh, so what we've got uh, in terms of our monthly data, we have got uh, monthly returns for all of the remaining years uh, and to assess uh, whether the other January effect really exists, we have to test uh, whether average uh, returns in the rest of the year, apart from January, are affected by January returns. Note that we cannot use just average annual returns because January is a component of those and you would expect them to be correlated uh, just by construction. So you have to uh, remove January from uh, the uh, annual performance to really test predictability. So for the return in January, uh, the easiest way of assessing it uh, based on the data structure is to use the average ifs function that will also help us with the rest of the year calculations. The average range would be the returns here uh, and the uh, criteria uh, would be first we need to check for the relevant year that the year is exactly the year we're looking for so 1816 in this particular case and then the month as we're testing for January should be one. So we see quite uh, obviously the 1816 January return is 0.97% as it's given here. For 1817, that's 1.6% picked up correctly from here and so on. For the rest of the year, we just need to adapt the function we have just written. Uh, instead of one, we can say doesn't equal one and that would average over all of the months in a particular year apart from January. So we see the average return in 1816 apart from January is minus 0.25 percent which is exactly the case if we just do it manually. So that means that we can uh, enforce these throughout our sample, throughout all 206 years that we're concerned with. Uh, and uh, just to remain uh, in the spirit of the Cooper et al. paper, we also uh, create a dummy variable based on the return in January. So if the return in January is less than zero, uh, we put one and zero otherwise. Uh, why is that? Well, we want to test whether this sort of binary signal based on return in January being negative or not uh, can also be powerful for predictability, replicating what Cooper et al. Uh, have done. Uh, quite notably, uh, the main sample that uh, Cooper et al. use uh, is 1940 uh, until 2003, but we obviously have 21 more years in our data here. And just as they do in one of the robustness checks, we do go back to 1816. Now let's estimate the regression for the full sample. We want a linear regression of rest of the year returns on January returns first, one one for the additional statistics and for the constant. And we see that uh, on average, if the January return is zero, the average monthly return across uh, the rest of the year is around uh, 0.45%. However, with every uh, percentage point of January return, that increases by around five basis points. And if the January return is negative, that decreases by five basis points. So if, say, uh, the return in January is around uh, 10%, you could expect the average return across the rest of the uh, of the year to be around 1% per month, which is quite uh, a large uh, figure. So that would be 11% in the remaining 11 months. And if January uh, return is minus 10%, then the um, annual return uh, across the entire year would be less than zero. So it means that if January return is minus 10% or lower, then there is no reason to invest in the stock market, really. You're better off uh, sitting in cash or holding government bonds, on average at least. And we can test for significance, uh, dividing coefficients by the respective standard errors, uh, dragging it across, and evaluating the significance using a two-tailed t-distribution, and plugging in the absolute values of the t-statistics and the degrees of freedom locked. 
So we see here the p-value for the uh, January variable is uh, slightly ahead of 5%. So it means that this result is not significantly 5% across the full sample, but it's significantly 10%. So we've got a statistically significant uh, positive uh, predictability of the January return uh, in terms of all of the uh, remaining year average returns. So it seems that this predictability does really hold. And in terms of the uh, binary predictability, so essentially whether the return is negative or not, we can use the same logic. We can regress the rest of the year returns onto the dummy variable equal to one if the uh, January return is negative and zero otherwise. Um, and here we have got uh, a negative coefficient, minus 0 0.48. Uh, that means that if the January return is positive, uh, we expect to get roughly 0.7% uh, per month. Uh, if it's uh, negative, we expect to get roughly 0.21% per month, so 48 basis points lower. And again, we can use uh, the t-test to evaluate the statistical significance. And this provides uh, an evaluation that uh, for the uh, dummy variable, the effect across the full sample of more than 200 years uh, is significantly 5% actually. Uh, so here, uh, the dummy variable predictability is uh, more robust, essentially, is stronger. Uh, but what uh, can also be done is, uh, well, looking at uh, particular subsamples. Uh, the reason why, uh, for instance, the Cooper et al. paper starts in 1940, in terms of its main sample for, in particular, is because over the Great Depression, uh, which is defined as 1929 to 1939 in the paper, the effect kind of collapses. And that's what we can quite easily see if we just visualize the performance of the signal over the course of the Great Depression period. Uh, we see that the complete reverse is actually true. Uh, as uh, very positive uh, January returns, we can see uh, 29, 1930, 1931, the January return is uh, quite substantial, but the annual uh, returns in the rest of the month are very, very uh, much negative. Uh, and the reverse is true. For instance, in uh, uh, 1935 and 1939, the January return was negative and the return uh, in the remaining 11 months was positive. Similar is uh, true of 1939. Uh, so uh, basically this period can be discarded as uh, an outlier, well obviously because the Great Depression was particularly uh, unusual uh, from an economic perspective and it definitely um, le left its impact on financial markets. So we could look at what happens uh, before it, before 1929, and most importantly for the present day, after it, after 1940, including the most recent 21 years that are missing from the Cooper et al. sample for obvious reasons. Uh, so before 1929, if we use a uh, linear regression and get to 1928 inclusive, we'll see that the coefficient in terms of the uh, magnitude is almost twice as large as uh, for the full sample. Uh, and if we evaluate the significance with the t-test, we see that it's significant 5%. And uh, similarly, if we test the dummy variable, this result is comparable to the full sample result. And if we look at uh, p-values, this would be significant at 10% if we look at uh, the early years of the existence of the New York Stock Exchange before 1929. 
And then we look at the period after 1940, so essentially the modern history of the other January effect. We'll see that, again, the coefficient is positive. And if we evaluate it for significance, we'll see that 5% level of significance is maintained. And looking at the simple uh, dummy variable model, the same is true. And here, the DSTAT is almost uh, 3, which is signaling that the result uh, has quite uh, high level of statistical significance. It's significant at 1% for the uh, directional predictability for the dummy variable after 1940. It's also quite notable is that if we look at uh, 206 years, even including the uh, Great Depression period where this relationship did not uh, fulfill, the full sample results are still statistically significant. So that is a testament to how strong this effect is. And if we look at as much data as possible, uh, this particular relationship uh, remains uh, quite substantial, quite strong. And uh, therefore, uh, unlike the conventional January effect discovered in the early 80s and uh, almost disappearing since the turn of the millennium, the other January effect reigns supreme and can be used to guide uh, your market turn and can be used in forecasting of uh, stock market returns uh, to enable various market timing strategies and uh, to uh, figure out, uh, for instance, whether uh, to pursue a more or less aggressive strategy in terms of asset allocation. What would happen to the other January effect as it becomes uh, more popular or if it becomes more popular, uh, we shall only see. But uh, for the time being, that's all there is for the other January effect and its modeling in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm making to see any further suggestions for videos that you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and stay tuned.